I'm here with Hamza. Hey. Welcome. I'm super happy to have Hamza here. Uh, I'm going to be asking a ton of questions throughout the night, uh, but feel free to uh, interrupt if you do have one. We're going to try to you know, get all the bases covered uh, first. And uh, if you have any questions afterward, we'll, we'll both be here. Hamza also has his book, The Burnout Gamble. We're going to be giving away one free copy as well. Uh, maybe if someone asks a really good question. <laughs> maybe too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be asking, we'll be asking some questions and uh, feel free, like I said, to participate in the discussion. So feel free, you've got one-on-one -on -one opportunity here. Um, let me grab my notes. One second. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for coming out. This is uh, really, really nice. Let's define burnout. So Hamza has uh, worked on, or at least communicated these 12 stages of burnout. Um, so we can, I don't know if you have to hit all 12, but yeah, I'd yeah, love yeah. To, uh, to help define that. For sure. I, I do this anytime I go and I speak about burnout, and I ask people to define burnout for me because I'm always surprised at how little exposure we've had to this phrase. You feel like you're working, but you're never getting anywhere, uh -huh. or you're sleeping eight hours a day, but you're not feeling like you're getting any rest. That's a really, really good. It encompasses both of what you said over here. It's complete physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion. Burnout can be experienced in shades, and there's no one size fits all burnout. One of the biggest mistakes that I made when I started researching burnout is I thought that it's linear, that you have to pass through all 12 stages. Now let me quickly read these 12 stages to you. Uh, and put your hands up if you've gone through this, if you're going through it, or if you know somebody who's going through it. The compulsion to prove oneself, where you feel like you need to really prove something to yourself, prove it to other people, that you feel like you know you gotta you gotta stake your claim. Hands up if this is you. What about working harder? Stage number two. So the natural reaction to the compulsion to prove yourself is you work harder, you're neglecting your needs. Displacement of conflicts, number four. So you're finding yourself in situations in which you're having conflicts with people, but you push them to the side. You like, can't deal with this right now. It could be with your partner, your parents, your friends. You're pushing your problems away. Hands up if this is you or you know somebody like this, okay? And then number five is revision of values, where you start to question the values that comprise who you are as a person, the values that you are associated with you, your leadership values, you begin to revise them. You don't believe in the things that you once believed in. It happens to me in the first step, I'm like, I'm fine, nothing's wrong with me. But usually by stage six is when you're like, no, it's not my fault, it's yours. I'm not the problem, you are. Number seven is withdrawal. So you pull away from your friends, your family, you just can't deal with it anymore. I'm not going to ask about stages 8 to 12, they're very personal, and I think we'll talk about this eventually, uh, you know, the mental health piece of this as well. But stage 8 onwards is when you should really consult a uh, professional, where the book is no longer sufficient to help you over here, conversations with friends and family are no longer sufficient. You really got to go see a therapist, you got to go see a doctor. Stage 8 is odd behavioral changes, number 9 is depersonalization, 10 is inner emptiness, 11 is depression, and 12 is complete and utter burnout. So one of the mistakes I was mentioning earlier is that I thought you had to go through all of those stages in succession, but burnout is actually a circle. And you can jump from one stage to another, you can enter into stage 12 right off. If you could explain the first time you went through burnout, or the first time you experienced it, and how you kind of, how you felt, or how you knew, or didn't know it was happening. Uh, threw myself at other people's portfolios, and I found myself in one particular stretch working 72 hours straight. And so I was getting no sleep. Something's up. I don't know what's going on over here. I got up. I felt queasy. I went to the bathroom. And uh, I remember looking in the mirror at the in the bathroom and seeing like a sunken version of myself. Just bags underneath my eyes, pale skin. I looked sick. And I just passed out. And I passed out and uh, flash forward, loud rapping at the door. And I don't know what time it is. I'm on the floor. My shirt's off because apparently I was burning up. And someone's knocking on the door, boom, 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 open up, it's the janitor, G -g 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 -g. open up. I was in the handicap stall, and I looked at my phone, there's like 50 text messages, and like 10 to 12 hours had elapsed at this point. So I've been so exhausted, I passed out of the bathroom floor of Sony Music Entertainment for like 12 hours. I get up, grab my things, run out the door, and I go home. To answer your question, um, I didn't talk about it after that, because especially for somebody with those performance pressures that I was feeling, factors from without, factors from within, I just thought it was weakness. I just thought it was weak. And especially in the South Asian community, you know that mental illness is not a thing. You don't talk about mental health. Uh, we just pretend like you're just weak. 
Uh, and it's something that I want to talk about more about and advocate for, especially in, in racialized communities. That we, we have to stop associating burnout and, and sort of you know, the rigor that comes with this work and the wear and tear that you experience with weakness. I mean, sometimes it's just straight up a, a mental health issue. So that was uh, when I first burned out and I just kind of brushed it under the rug and didn't talk about it since. So um, the next thing, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, kind of a lesson, something that you um, wish you knew um, when you were starting post-secondary, uh, for example. Because this internship happened while you're already in school, you're already working, so um, what's something that you wish you knew um, before you started school? I wish I could go back and tell myself that you don't just have to go to therapy as something that's corrective. You can go to therapy as something preemptive. It's more profitable when you don't feel enough, when you don't feel perfect enough, when you don't feel efficient enough, when you don't feel uh, progressive enough, satisfied enough, and innovative enough. We exploit that as marketers, and so I would encourage myself to feel enough. Before people, like the word hustle wasn't really trending in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, people would just work and you wouldn't really know about it, right? They would just call it work, right? And I would love to know your thoughts on the trend almost of of the grind and the hustle and entrepreneurship. I remember when that first video dropped where he did the Crush It video, and like, young Gary, right? Yeah, yeah. And he got up there and he really spoke to me at that point in my life. He's like, Crush It, you work from nine to five, and then you work from five to nine. Like, he was human fuel for me. I was like, yes, let's go, Gary. And then he dropped one line that messed me up. He's like, don't go home and watch fucking Lost. Did yeah. I swear? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that line. He's like, don't go home and watch fucking Lost. And I hated Lost at the time. I didn't watch it. <laughs> so it was very valiant for me. Like, yeah, all my loser friends watch Lost. I'm going to go home and watch it. And then, of course, I discovered Lost. <laughs> and Lost is a great show. <laughs> Lost is a fantastic show. Up until, like, the last five seasons, right? <laughs> Out of 17. Or, it gets really, really wonky towards the end. And I remember thinking to myself, during my peak Lost uh, that this is actually replenishing to me. Like, I actually feel better when I watch this, and I feel inspired. I love the writing of Damon Lindelof and team, and uh, you know I was doing a lot of writing at that time. It was very uh, nourishing for me, and I did better work because I made time for me. Right. And so I started unhinging myself from Gary Vee's messages, and similar to Blake, I was like, yeah, this guy's a bit much. Then he got super abrasive at one point. He was just dropping F-bombs all the time. I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me anymore. I checked out of Gary Vee. Uh, he just struck me as somebody that was going about this whole thing in a very unsustainable way. But I still stayed in touch by listening to the podcast, watching the talks, and reading the books. And I've seen, just like you've seen, a maturity of Gary Vee over time. And I've come back to him now, and he won me back over when he said that sleep is my competitive advantage. And I'm like, hmm, this is a very different Gary that I'm listening to. Sleep is my competitive advantage. And he's like, I get eight hours of sleep no matter what. I don't care if I have to miss meetings in the morning. And I was like, okay, maybe there's something to this. Let me try this. Let me emulate the same way of thinking. And I couldn't agree more. Like, sleep has become my competitive advantage. Last night, I got a solid eight. No coffee needed, no stimulants needed. Just a solid eight hours of sleep will work miracles for you. So, in terms of your lifestyle today, uh, obviously you recently you know, started this new role. Yep. Um, take us through one of your days right now. Oh, wow. Okay. How detailed can I get here, guys? Uh, <laughs> you want to know like a play by play? I like, yeah, I wouldn't say minute by minute, but yeah, okay. let's, let's get a good summary. Okay, well, let me tell you the secret weapon. The first thing, uh, I'm a morning person, I'm around five, and I do nothing for the first half an hour. I'm literally just still. No technology, no stimulus, no no books, no TV, nothing. I just sit there and I breathe and I just feel life coming back uh, into the shell of a human being. And I'm like, okay, great. So I drink some water, have a little snack, uh, and then I eat something properly. I go to the gym. Uh, that to me is like the most silence that I experience outside of that morning sort of meditation, meditative ritual. Go to the gym, get the endorphins going, come back, and then I start reading. And uh, again, no phone at this point. Like I haven't touched any device. No laptop has been opened. No email has been opened. No phone. Uh, you don't. You don't want that kind of frenetic energy first thing in the morning. The last thing you want is a notification. I don't want to have my my mind share distracted by all these little pings and red lights. So the first two hours of my day are just spent meditating, going to the gym, eating, reading, and sometimes I do writing. Um, you say the first two hours of, of the day after you wake up is when your cognitive capacity is at its highest. And uh, Robin Sharma actually talks about this thing, the 90-91 rule, you heard of this? So if you really want to move any project forward that you've been stalling on, for the first 90 minutes, for 90 days straight, work on one thing. And honestly, 9091 stacked several times on top of each other is what actually got this book done. Otherwise, with my schedule, I would have never had the time and capacity to write it. 
So that happens and I'm usually at my desk at Zoom Network working by 8.30, 9 in the morning. Uh, and from that point onwards, it's just this constant balance of managing my energy, making sure that I'm present for my team, uh, that I'm fulfilling the duties of managing director. Evenings, I try to leave work by five, by six tops. Uh, evenings are reserved for friends, family, myself, my partner. Um, and there's this lull where I'm not doing any work again. And then probably like an hour before I disconnect, which is usually around like eight or nine, I'll just check back in. I'll see if there's anything that needs to be resolved and I'll use two products, which I think you use as well, the five minute journal and the productivity planner. Mm -hmm. So I'll use those to sort of make meaning of my day, uh, understand the whims, productivity planner, looking at a very analog way of what my priorities are, checking things off, making sure I feel that sense of uh, accomplishment or I feel that pang of, okay, I need to do better tomorrow. And then I'll put it away and let myself slip into two hours of no distractions, no blue light again, so that I can sleep out of bed. How long did it take you to get into that routine? Because once you started yeah. doing the role, I'm assuming that's when it... No, it, it's, been, it's been years, man. Okay. So I would say I started, the, the, the impetus for finding this routine came around 2012, when I realized that I wasn't getting anything done, I wasn't productive, that I had all this time, and I was doing what I call busy work, which is answering emails, organizing my calendar, meeting after meeting, and actually no priorities were moving forward. I spent too much time uh, doing busy work, too much time commuting, too much time with distractions, too much time uh, on leisure, and not enough time uh, and energy and attention given to the things that I need to accomplish. So that for me was a wake up call and I realized that, okay, what do I need to do over here? Do I stay up longer or do I wake up earlier? Mm -hmm. And there's diminishing returns for staying up longer. Um, so I wake up earlier now and I try to get the most out of my, my day that way. How does someone actually or effectively manage that? And is that possible? It's very difficult. Jack Dorsey at Twitter, mm -hmm. he themes his days. So Monday will be about people, Tuesday will be about product, Wednesday will be about promotion. He will focus on for all of his entities at the same time. So initially I did the same thing. I'm like, okay, so if I'm building Splash Effect, Skills Camp, and working at Ryerson University, I don't want to be able, I don't want to have to shift gears all this much and then find myself exhausted by like new. Do you keep yourself in check? It's so important. Uh, for me, end of the day, I'm fucking to ask myself every night. And then I make sure no matter what happens, no matter how late it gets, I have to do that. You have to do that, right? So for me to maintain my sanity and for me to feel totally uh, you know, there, similar, similar to you, uh, is I will do that journal, five minute journal, first thing in the morning and last thing before I fall asleep. If I don't do that, the day hasn't really finished for me. Uh, gym in the morning at the same time. Uh, my meals, super consistent with those. Is there anything that could be diagnosed? Is there mental illness specifically associated with it? And what are your thoughts on that? Man, that is a great question. And this is where my imposter syndrome kicks in hard, man. Look at this book. There's no MSc, there's no PhD, dude. I'm just a guy who burned out, who, who, who experienced burnout, who did the reading on it and realized that there was a problem because the, the, the research was very dense very boring and didn't provide the context that would explain my circumstances. So I, with my solutionist mindset, decided to consolidate all of that, put it into this book and be like, look, anybody who's going through it, this is like an intro, a one-on-one -on -one apologist that I've cited in this book. Um, I'm not an expert, I can't speak to the mental health issues, but I will say this, when you look at the 12 stages of burnout, there are some that explicitly use language that is associated with mental health challenges anxiety, depression, and loneliness, isolation, so on and so forth. So there is definitely a link there. And when you talk to anybody who's knowledgeable in the field who study this, they will say that the underlying problem, and I talked about this very early in the book, even though the book is called The Burnout Gamble, really within like five pages you're gonna realize that this book is not about burnout, it's actually about stress. And stress being what you just said at the beginning, the health epidemic of the 21st century. Um, Stress, specifically de-stress, because there is such a thing as good stress. De-stress is a stress that throws you out of balance, um, that leads to emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion. That's really what the book is about. And people who um, have been thrown out of balance, there's a direct correlation between that and mental health challenges, and I assume vice versa. How to recover from burnout if you're experiencing it, and then the second part, nurturing resilience, building resilience, uh, is really the inoculation against burnout happening again join this club and start this venture and work here and work there and you're almost encouraged to burn out. They don't say it in those terms. They're like say yes to everything until you absolutely can. And that style of working uh, came with a lot of reward for me. So people really love that, you know, Hamza's attentive, he's reactive, if you want something done, give it to Hamza, he's a productive guy. Uh, and I took that and I wore that as a badge of honor and I found myself, again, um, saying yes to everyone else. But when you say yes to other, everyone else, when you say yes to other priorities, 
chances are you're saying no to something else. And in my case, that was no to me. Um, so when I gave you that five things, again, friends, family, work, fitness, sleep, uh, I was saying yes to work and no to everything else. And I was, you know, uh, applying five times the capacity to work. I kind of have always been under the mindset that when you're young, you should be saying yes to everything because that's when you're getting the most experience and that's when you have the most energy. And as your priorities change and relationships and that type of thing becomes more important to you, then you probably want more time for you. So what was the age that you kind of switched things up? That is an amazing question. Your name again? Amber. Amber. Um, I switched up too late. So there was a point, there was a marker in the road where I should have been like, yeah, Hamza, this is enough. Like you're doing enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went way past that because I didn't have this. I didn't have the experience to talk to like-minded people. There was no dialogue about mental health. At least that was happening in my context. Uh, the first time I learned about burnout was after the last time I experienced burnout, which was like I think four or five years ago. So I pushed through several episodes of burnout, not knowing what it was called. For me, it was just weakness. And now my mantra has become not just do the things, it's do the right things. Only in the last probably year or two, realized the power of saying no to things. And I guess I just thought, well, it's just nice to be agreeable and say yes. And I heard a quote recently from a woman, if you can't say no, your yes means nothing. Ooh. Fantastic questions, and this has been an absolute honor. Great, thank you so much for, for being like said. Oh, so generous with your time, it's awesome. awesome.